Hey everybody, it's Pastor David from Walden Church, and we are going to start a new Bible study going through the book of Revelation, and we're going to do this every single week, and we're going to do it in small, bite-sized chunks. Should be only 10 to 15 minutes uh, a piece. And so we're going to start this book, and it's not going to be four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks. It's going to go on for a long time, which means we're going to go slow. Okay, and that's, that's good news, right? To go through the book of Revelation slowly. Easy to understand. I think we're going to open this book and just approach it as a letter to the church. Because that's what it is, right? The book of Revelation is a letter to the church. God writing a letter to us. And I think if God wrote you a letter, you'd want to know what it said. You'd want to know how to read it. And I think... When we think about Revelation, we always think of it as being a scary book. And it shouldn't be scary, right? It shouldn't be uh, a book we avoid. We think it has all of these, like, Dante's Inferno-type imagery uh, and, 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 and symbolism. And so we think that, well, it can't be understood, or it, or it can't be properly understood, or there's too many ways to interpret it. And I kind of want to cut through all of that and just say, let's read it and try, right? Let's read it and try our best. Because I think there's a lot of rumor also about this book. And I think we can, we can squash some of that rumor as we go along. And I'd also encourage you that you should read this as we read it together, right? Read it on your own. If you're not gonna read it right now uh, with me, then take a few minutes and read it on your own. Now, now more than ever, right? I think we need this book now more than ever. Not only because of, you know, the election coming up or things that are happening over in the Middle East, uh, people associating that what's happening now is similar to like the plagues of Exodus. I think there's some end time fear in a lot of people. So I think now more than ever. Um, a little history, a little context to frame this book. Uh, Revelation is written by John. John is one of the only disciples to not be executed. Instead, he is banished. Right? He's banished to a prison island called Patmos, and it's there that he's going to live out his life. I think he dies around the age of 90 years old. And he starts this letter off by writing to seven churches. Now, we would assume that he knows these churches personally, but, I mean, that's, that's not known. We know that Jesus knows these churches personally, and he's asking John to write this letter to these churches. Um, and just like John being in prison, and him feeling like he is persecuted by Rome, these churches are persecuted by Rome. And so John is instructing these churches to remain faithful. In chapter 1, where we're going to start, the church is identified as a lampstand. So when you see the word lampstand at the very beginning, um, each one of those lampstands is a representation for one of the churches. So we are a light, right? We are a light on a hill or a light on a stand. And certainly, that's one of the teachings that Jesus had. Matthew 5, verse 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And I would think the takeaway from that is that we are to be the light. We are to be the light of the world, a light that leads people to Jesus, a light that leads people to salvation, a light that leads people to healing, a light that helps broken people heal, a light that leads people to safety. And the entire Bible is a story about light, the story that begins with light. In the book of Genesis, God says, let there be light, and there was light. The book ends with light here in Revelation. And then when John writes his gospel, John 1 verse 4 says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. Now he himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming to the world. So the light is 
us, we carry the light, but it's also Christ, right? And here at the beginning of Revelation, John is going to say that he sees all these lampstands. He sees these seven lampstands. And then he says he sees a shadowy figure in amongst the lampstands. And John says it's, it looks like the Son of Man. That is a reference from the book of Daniel. Daniel says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming from the clouds from heaven. And this is how Jesus referred to himself. It was Jesus' most popular, most famous way of describing himself. Jesus called himself the Son of Man. It was a reference to this passage from Daniel. So I think you've got enough information to start reading Revelation chapter 1. I think you have enough backstory, right? So let, let's start. Revelation chapter 1, we're going to read the first three verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. Notice that the passage begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this is where the title comes from, right? It's a revelation, and it's revealing who Jesus Christ is. Well, isn't that the entire purpose of the Bible? To reveal who Jesus Christ is? And John makes it his thesis statement. He puts it right there at the top. It's at the very beginning. Of course, this book talks about end times. Of course, this book talks about prophecy. But just like any other book in the Bible, it's also a book about who Jesus Christ is. That's the purpose of this book. So we should be able to read this book and get a clear picture of who Jesus is. I think when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you get a picture of the human side of Jesus, right? You see the flesh and blood Jesus. You see the Jesus that uh, forgave and healed and who died on the cross. But after that, Jesus goes to heaven. He hasn't been as close to the church physically. And now the church is fledgling. It's a startup. It's on its own. It's trying. There's this oppressive government that's fighting against it and fighting back on their beliefs. And the church is very counterculture right now and it's stepping out into the picture for the first time and now the church is going to get hope and inspiration from a kingly Jesus, right? A a lion Jesus, a a, a more godly picture of Christ, a, a Christ who sits on the throne. So reading Revelation should really be exciting because this is a new picture of Jesus that we haven't had before. Before, we've had this shepherd Jesus walking through dirt roads and sandals. Now we're going to see this heavenly being, Jesus in all his glory. And I think Revelation also reveals like the vast gap that takes place between us and God, right? In the, in the Gospels, Jesus and us, we were very close, very on the same plane. Jesus was relatable. Revelation is going to put the separation there and say, oh, well, there's, there's this and then there's this, right? There's, there's us and then there's God. There's, there's our power and there's God's power. There's what we can do and there's what God can do. And I think that's exciting. We need this. We need to see this. We need to see uh, that, you know, I think it's because we live in this day and age where the world elevates us, right? The world makes us important. The world elevates the human body, it elevates the human mind, it elevates all the things that we can accomplish, and we celebrate how fast we are, and how strong we are, and how smart we are, and how beautiful we are, and how rich we are. And we're so proud of all those things, and it puts a lot of confidence in us, and perhaps a lot of arrogance in us. And then John writes in Revelation, yeah, well, there's you, and then there's God. There's where you think you are, but then there's really where God is. And it's, it's almost like a way of saying, well, you, you think you're rich? There's your rich and then there's God's rich. You know, you think you're beautiful? God's beautiful. And then notice what John writes in verse 3. He says, blessed is the one who reads aloud these words of prophecy and 
blessed are those who hear. Well, guess what? You're reading the book right now, and you're hearing the words right now. And if you look closely at verse 3, you'd see you're blessed, right? You are blessed. And check this out. There's just a little spoiler alert. If I skip all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation 22, 7 says, And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I bet you already know what I'm going to say before I say it, right? This is the only book in the Bible that begins and ends with a blessing for those who read it. And yet, we don't read it. We ignore it. Don't you want blessing in your life? I do. So I think we got to be stop uh, being scared of this book. Right, church? I think we need to read it. God says read it. Let's read it. Verse 4 says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. It's a very formal way of writing a letter. The letter is to real churches. They are all in and around modern day Turkey. And they were the first readers of this book. I think if God was going to write a letter to seven real churches who live in the first century, and this book is going to be a letter of encouragement, a letter of hope, a letter of maybe here's some things where, you know, I wish you guys would do better. Wouldn't you think that you'd write a letter that they could understand? Of course, they understood this book. So if they understood this book with God's direction, we should be able to understand this book also, right? It says, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Who's that? It's God, right? And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. Okay, there was a lot there, right? There was. There's greetings from God, greetings from Jesus and greetings from the seven spirits before the throne. And this is where you say, I'm already lost. <laughs> I'm barely a couple verses into this book and I'm already lost. Uh, don't, don't panic. Think about everything rationally, okay? John says this letter is from God, Jesus, and the seven spirits. Rationally, who is worthy to be listed in the same sentence as God and Jesus? The Holy Spirit, right? Absolutely. Nobody else is worthy to be in that place. So why does he say the seven spirits and not just one spirit? Well, it's probably because this letter is to seven churches. Maybe he's saying that the Spirit of God resides with each of those churches. Could also be that seven is a perfect number. Those are both good possibilities. If we look at the book of Zechariah, this is another book of Revelation, another book of prophecy. Zechariah has a vision, and he's also in exile, and God's people are being persecuted and they need some encouragement while they're in Babylon. Zechariah writes about four horsemen and seven lampstands. Zechariah 4.2 says, And God said to me, What do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on top of it, and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 10, These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. So what is the symbolism of these seven lampstands here? God says they carry his spirit and that the seven eyes range through the earth. I know that's not totally understandable. I get it. It's not totally clear. But remember, we're talking about God. And I think that's part of the struggle. We want God to be easily understood. God is not easily understood. I know you want it to be easy. I know you want to read this book and you want to have everything clearly spelled out for you. And it's nice. It is nice to sit in church. It's nice to sit in Sunday school and to have everything spelled out for us. But part of reading this book is the struggle. 
part of reading this book on your own is facing the struggle and wrestling with the truth. The Bible is meant to make you think. It's meant to give you thoughts. It's meant to give you ideas that stick with you. These words of God should make you think. It's, it's okay to not have all the answers about God. It's okay to not have all the answers about the Bible. It's even okay to not have all the answers about your own faith and your own life. Look, let's say you're uh, too scared to share your faith with another person. You say, you know what, I've never shared my faith with another person because I feel like I just don't know enough, right? That's, that's hogwash, of course you do. I like to ride roller coasters. Maybe uh, you do too, okay? So there's a brand new roller coaster. You've never ridden it before and you ride it for the very first time. You go out the exit and one of the people says, who is waiting in line, what was it like? Now, you're thinking to yourself, I only rode it one time. I don't know that I have enough information to share with this person about what it's like. Of course you do. You experienced it. You experienced it and this person has never experienced it. So you have plenty to tell them about, plenty to describe. What if somebody said, you know, I've been thinking about God lately and I don't really understand the Trinity. How is God one but three? How is Jesus God or how is the Holy Spirit God? You would say, you know, I don't really understand it either, but I mean, he's God and it's probably a difficult thing for people to understand, but here's how I think about it, right? You could do your best. You could say, well, God is kind of like an egg. You know, he's three parts. He's a shell and then there's a white part and then there's the yolk, but it all comes together and it's an egg. You could say it's kind of like water. Um, God has three forms, just like water has three forms. Uh, water can be ice, water can be vapor, God, uh, water can be liquid. But God is not water, God is not an egg, right? We can't figure God out, and that's okay. But if you're gonna share your faith with someone, or talk to them about who God is, or even talk to them about some of these harder questions, you can do it. You can do it. You have more information than they do, and you can share how you see it, your point of view, your experience. I think we get frustrated with revelation and maybe even our own faith because we're trying to figure it out. We, we are meaning makers, we're answer wanters, right? And that's not the point of life. The point of life is not to uh, have all the answers. That's not even the point of the church. You know, if you sit in Sunday school and you're hoping that you're in Sunday school or you're in church because you're going to figure it out, you're going to figure God out, I'll, I'll tell you right now, that's never going to happen. You, you can't simplify God to the point in our human minds that we'll figure him out. This is God we're talking about. Revelation is not going to put God in a nice, neat box for you that you can carry back out the door. You can't dissect God. How would you describe God then? How would you understand God then? I think there's a lot of ways that we can't. And that's okay. This is where you say, I don't know if I will be able to understand this book. You can read this book. You can. You can read this book just like you can share your faith. Just like you can teach Sunday school. You could. You could teach Sunday school. You could lead a Bible study. You could lead a small group in your home. You can. You know enough right now. Yes, you can. Stop telling yourself that you can't. Stop telling yourself that you don't know enough or that you're not strong enough Christian or that you don't have enough faith. You do. And as we begin Revelation, I think you need to just come to grips with that 
there are things about God that we can't and may never understand. And that's okay. But we don't come to church to understand God completely, right? We come to church to worship God. We come to church to love God and to love each other, to fellowship, and to understand our role. How do I fit in all of this? That's what I'm hoping we'll begin to unlock as we study these pages in the book of Revelation. Well, that's our time. See? Nice and short. See you guys next time. Bye.